the ultimate goal of any scientist doing a research project is to write up what they found, write up your results and get it published by a science journal so that you can share all this new knowledge you've gained with the world. Now that is exactly what I did last month when my paper on the colours and shapes of galaxies was published by the monthly notices of the Royal Astronomical Society. This is my ninth first author paper I've published. First author meaning that I was the lead or the main researcher on a project and I am proud of every single one of my nine papers. They're like my little research babies, right? <laughs> in this particular paper I've written in collaboration with Professor Karen Masters at Haverford College in Pennsylvania and the rest of the Galaxy Zoo team. This was a fun like side research project that took about six months in total. I sort of did it alongside my main research strand on you know how supermassive black holes grow and how they affect the galaxies that they live in. Now the problem with scientific papers like this is that they are written for other scientists. They use the language that you would use to talk to other experts, your colleagues, rather than the language that you would use to speak to, you know, your family or your friends. And so I found that scientific papers like this, they often need translating so that the public can understand them. And that's exactly why I started my YouTube channel. I wanted to be sort of that like intermediate, you know, your friendly neighborhood astrophysicist that you could ask anything and could explain what was going on in, in terms of the new science results. And I figured, well, why not translate my own scientific paper as well? So let's, let's just start with the title, first of all. So the title is Quantifying the Poor Purity and Completeness of Morphological Samples Selected by colour. What that means is if you're trying to make a collection or a sample of galaxies that have a specific shape, but you don't actually know their shape, then how many of the wrong shaped galaxies make it into that sample if you use the colour instead? Now morphology is the fancy word for shape here, and the shape of a galaxy essentially encodes its history. Has it been left alone to form these big, beautiful spiral shapes, or has it merged with another galaxy, turning it into just a big amorphous blob? So if you select galaxies of one particular shape, you can isolate essentially that specific way that a galaxy might have evolved to, to study that. And you might be thinking, well, why, if you're interested in the shape, would you bother using color to pick those out? Why wouldn't you just eyeball all the images and go, yes, I want that one because it's that shape. No, I don't want that one because it's not the right shape. And the answer is fairly simple. It's because of big data. Space is famously very big and there's a lot of galaxies in it as well. So when we do like big surveys of the sky, we get a telescope to look at different chunks and record how many galaxies there are in each chunk of the sky. Even when we do that with just the Northern Hemisphere sky, we get over a million galaxies that we've identified. So getting, you know, that kind of influx of data and going, how on earth am I gonna pick out the galaxies that I care about from this a million? I can't eyeball a million images because it's just a mammoth task. It's too much for one person. Now this is why the Galaxy Zoo project was set up. It's a website that asks the public to help classify the shapes of galaxies, essentially, you know, like a division of labor. You just need thousands of people to make it work. And work it did, because those a million galaxies in the Northern Hemisphere that I was talking about, they came from a survey called the Sloan Digital Sky Survey. And when Galaxy Zoo was first set up, that was the first batch of data that was put in. And in record time, six months, every single one of those images have been classified 40 times each, which is phenomenal. And there's still more data on the site today as well, now that those have all been classified, if you still want to help out with this mammoth scientific task. The likelihood is that you're going to be the first ever human being to set eyes on each galaxy image that you're shown, because they've just been sat on computer hard drives before that. So Galaxy Zoo massively revolutionized this area of science in loads of different ways, from being able to find a lot more of the really rare objects to study, to finding brand new things that had never been seen before, or allowing people to study the entire galaxy population statistically for the first time. You get a better representation of what is the norm and what isn't the norm. 
I cannot overstate how important those big statistical studies were that Galaxy Zoo made possible because before Galaxy Zoo, like a study that had maybe a hundred or a thousand galaxies that had their shapes labeled was considered lucky like 20 years ago. And it wasn't representative of, you know, the whole galaxy population as a whole, right? And I'm sure you're wondering, well, how does color come into all of this then? Now, even back to the very early days of Edwin Hubble himself in the 1920s, who figured out that galaxies were islands of billions of stars in their own right, people noticed that the spiral-shaped galaxies had a bluish color to them, whereas elliptical, blobbish-shaped galaxies were that sort of yellowish-red color. I know it doesn't look red, but us astronomers call that red because it's at the opposite end of the spectrum, the opposite end of the rainbow to blue light. More blue light meant lots of young, hot stars that live the shortest lives were present in a galaxy. So if you saw a blue galaxy, you knew that it was still forming lots of young new stars. Whereas more red light in a galaxy meant that you had more cooler, smaller stars, which live the longest time. So it was kind of like the dying embers of a fire. The galaxy that was reddish was no longer forming any stars. So because of that, it was thought that the two were correlated. If a galaxy changed shape, then it would also stop forming stars, or at least the process that triggered that change in shape would also trigger it to stop forming stars, something like the merger of two galaxies. So as telescopes started to get built to do these huge surveys of the sky and map it out and find all of the galaxies possible, it was in the early 2000s, before the days of Galaxy Zoo, that astronomers found themselves in this position of far too much data, too much for you know one person to, to sit down and eyeball all of the images and classify the shapes. However, what they could do very easily was measure the color. They could automate measuring the color. What they would do is they put a filter on their telescope that only let in the red light from a galaxy and record how bright the galaxy was through that filter. Then they do the same thing just with a filter that only let in blue light and again record how bright it was in blue light. If you then take one from the other, you have a number that says how red or blue something is. A lower number meant more blue light and a larger number meant more red light. And you could do this with any type of filter you wanted, not just red and blue, but ultraviolet and visible light or visible light and infrared light. Either way, you could get a number to say how red or blue the galaxy was and you could just compute that. Essentially, you would end up with a huge big table, an Excel spreadsheet, right, of like the galaxy name or coordinates that you were looking at and then the brightness in red, the brightness in blue, take one from the other and there you go, there is your color. And then you can take that data and go and do a lot of science and statistics on it and learn something new. So because color was so easy to measure and shape wasn't, and the two were correlated, people tended to use color as a shortcut, what we call a proxy for the shape or morphology of a galaxy. And that was sort of through the 2000s until Galaxy Zoo came along and got enough people to actually look at the galaxy images. And crucially, it was members of the public. It wasn't experts who might have had that bias of already knowing that, you know, blue stuff is probably a spiral and red stuff is probably an elliptical. So when they see it, saw something that perhaps wasn't as obvious, that bias was taken away. And so one of the first results from Galaxy Zoo was actually to show that 30% of spirals, a pretty huge chunk of them, are actually red and not blue. And this was actually work my colleague, Professor Karen Masters published in 2010, back when I was still an undergrad student. Now you would think a result like that 30% of spirals actually being red would stop people from doing this, stop using color as a shortcut or a proxy for the shape of a galaxy. But unfortunately not. If you have no other choice, if you have such a big data set and you don't have these classifications from Galaxy Zoo, you don't really have another option and it's the best you have to go about getting some answers. But ideally, if you are still gonna use color, what you wanna know is well, how contaminated is my sample of galaxies that I'm gonna select, you know? How biased am I gonna be? So you can bear that in mind when you're analyzing your results and you're discussing the implications of it. So that is exactly what I set out to do. Essentially put a number on. How contaminated are galaxy samples if you use color as this shortcut or proxy for shapes that at least other astronomers know if they're doing that 
or convince them to stop doing that in the first place. So there's two measurements that we actually looked at to do this. The first one is what's known as the purity of something. It's essentially the number of true positives divided by the true positives plus the false positives. So in this case, it's the number of blue things that were actually spirals divided by all the things you select as blue, the actual blue spirals and the blue blobs as well. You can think of it as like how contaminated a sample is. Then you've also got something called the completeness, how complete your sample is. Again, it's the true positives divided by the true positives plus the false negatives. So it's the number of blue things that are actually spirals divided by all the spirals, the things you should have selected, but you missed like the red spirals, which are your false negatives. By definition, as you up the purity, the completeness, it comes it down, right? So it really is a balancing act over which one you're going to favor if you're picking a sample like this. Do you care more about purity or do you care more about completeness? So we worked out what this purity and completeness was if you were going to select the spiral, the disky things as just those that were blue, and you were going to try and select the smooth round blobs as those that were red for all these different color combinations of different filters, right? To work out which one was the best and which one was the worst. So you can see we plotted out how the purity and the completeness change when you move the dividing line between what you define as blue and red, that's that dashed black line running vertically there. And we found out that the best color was this one, NUV minus R, the near ultraviolet filter, the bluest of the blue, minus the R filter in visible light. Which, confusingly, the R doesn't stand for red, it's actually in the middle of sort of like the visible light region, meaning that it's probably more like it's letting in green light. So with this color, we found out we could balance the purity and completeness to get a 92% pure and 92% complete collection of spirally, disky things, but only 65% pure and 65% complete collection of smooth blobs. That means that when you select red things to try and get blobs, your sample is contaminated by 35%. Any other combination of filters that you pick, any other color, and the numbers go down from there. So after we stated those results in the discussion section of the paper, we then went on essentially to warn people against doing this, especially if they were trying to select a sample of the smooth, round, blobbish things to study because the numbers were so bad. We basically said, do not do this unless you have no other choice. Instead, you should use Galaxy Zoo classifications if they exist for the, the, the data sample that you're working on. Or even you should use like an automated method where you look at the distribution of brightness of light in the image to get sort of like a rough estimate of how concentrated it is, for example. Or even use machine learning where you get a machine or a computer to classify the images for you instead, which in theory should be a lot quicker. Now, machine learning has come on leaps and bounds in the past 10 years, especially in its uses in astronomy and astrophysics. But you still have to be careful because either your machines have to be trained on something, a data set that has already been classified and could have biases inherent in those classifications, or you use an untrained machine which sort of learns what it needs to know from the images. And there we warn against doing that because machines can learn the same color biases as people and, and start to learn that, oh, blue must mean that it is this type of galaxy that you're looking for and lump it with all of the spirally disky things. So in the discussion, we were just trying to highlight that as an issue, you know, especially for the people who do a lot of machine learning astrophysics projects, just so that they're aware of it, can be cognizant of it, and then can change something in their code if necessary. So there you have it, a translation of my latest research paper, my little little side project that I've been doing alongside my research on supermassive black holes. But hopefully now when I say quantifying the poor purity and completeness of morphological samples selected by galaxy color, <laughs> you'll know exactly what it means. Before we get to the bloopers, a huge thank you to this week's video sponsor, Brilliant. Brilliant is an interactive online learning platform that gets you to learn by doing. The way I personally learn best, so I just think Brilliant is great. They have an ever-growing catalogue of courses across math, science, computer science, whatever you can think of, that help you to learn concepts in a visual, hands-on way. Now, a lot of the work I do as an astrophysicist is all done on computers with an increased reliance on machine learning techniques too. Now, Brilliant have a great computer science fundamentals course that introduces you to all the basic ideas you need to get you started, including the very basics of machine learning on how computers make 
decisions. So if you're currently dreaming of becoming a scientist one day as well, or you just want to brush up on the basics again, you know, maybe as part of a new year's resolution, then to get started for free, head to brilliant.org forward slash Dr. Becky, or you can click on the link in the video description down below. And the first 200 people will get 20% off an annual premium subscription. So thank you so much to Brilliant for sponsoring this video. And now we're all those bloopers. So one of the things that we actually calculated is known as the purity and purity. <laughs> mm, that's some purity. <laughs> Big data. So that's exactly what I'm trying to. So that's exactly what I set out to do. Use the classifications from Galaxy Zoo motorbike. Just got to my bit. Forward slash Dr. Becky, or you can clink, clink. You can clink on the link. <laughs> I could be brown, I could be blue, I could be violet sky, I could be purple, I could be purple, I could be any galaxy you like. <laughs>